Well, good morning. It is good to be here with you on this morning. My family and I flew in last night from uh, the Republic of Texas, and uh, <laughs> we are glad to be here in sunny Southern California. Um, I'm glad to be back here. I was born and raised in Los Angeles and um, got away from there as quickly as I could. Uh, <laughs> And uh, now live in Houston with my, my wife, and uh, who is here, She's back there in the back with our, our youngest. And seven of our eight children are here today. Um, <laughs> you know, somebody was over there waving, you know, don't worry about it. Um, so we're, we're glad to be here. And if you want to be praying for us, um, uh, we, we um, have several days here and plan to spend... Um, several days here, planned it a long time ago, and did not know that um, we would get a, a phone call from adoption agency. And so um, we will be adopting baby number nine uh, in, a, in a matter of, uh, of days after leaving here. Um, so if you just be praying for us as uh, nine kids, man. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. Open your Bibles with you. If you have them with you, open them to uh, Genesis chapter 45. Genesis 45. And I, I just have to confess uh, that I have uh, an overwhelming love for this book. I love the book of Genesis. I know it's all the Word of God. Amen? From Genesis to maps, okay? It's all the Word of God. Um, but I, and I just love Genesis. There are certain times in our lives where uh, there are books in the Bible that just begin to mean so much more to us. And uh, you know, I believe that Genesis is to the Old Testament what Romans is to the New. If you, if you want to really understand the theology of redemption in the New Testament, you just got to get Romans. You just have to. And I, I believe the same can be said of, of Genesis. And perhaps even, even more significant, just because of how foundational it is, just in those first 11 chapters alone, um, you have our understanding of the world and how it came to be, our understanding of the fall and of redemption, uh, the first glimpse of the gospel, uh, the, really the foundation of all of the major doctrines of the Christian faith right there in the beginning. Uh, the most beloved characters in the entire Bible we find there in Genesis. Um, they're the names that we know. You know, Adam and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and, of course, Joseph. We know that name and we know Joseph's story. I would argue we know Joseph's story better than anyone else's story, perhaps in Scripture, outside of Christ himself. Now, I say Abraham, you know events in Abraham's life. But I say Joseph, you know his story. I mean... You know the whole thing, the ins and outs and the intricacies of what happened to Joseph. I believe that for that very reason, it's important for us to pause and make sure that we understand that rightly. Because we have a tendency as Christians to look at the New Testament as our side of the book and the Old Testament as belonging to somebody else. Amen, somebody. Okay? I mean, that's how we think of it. The Old Testament, that, I mean, the New Testament, that, that's ours. That, that's our side of the book. The Old Testament, that's somebody else's side of the book. And it's okay. You know, every once in a while you can go over there because there's good stories over there, you know? And um, you go and you can read their story. And they're wonderful characters over there. And so what do we end up doing in the Old Testament? We either end up going and doing character studies, you know, which I just, I mean, that boggles my mind that we go there and do character studies because they're rotten. <laughs> they really are. Son, I want you to be like Abraham. Yes, son. So if, if I get a wife, I should like tell her to say that she's my sister so that she can. No, 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 no. You don't want to do that. Son, I want you to be like, just pick your Old Testament character. That's not how we want to be. But why do we want to find character there when we have the character of Christ? You know, or we go just trying to find stories with a moral. So it becomes Aesop's fables, you know. 
this person did this and it turned out well, so you do that and it'll turn out well. And then we live our lives and we do that and it doesn't turn out well. So what happened? What went wrong? Well, I want us to understand that the entire Bible is Christian literature. All of it. Not, not just the right side of the book. I remember as a new believer, I, I didn't grow up in church. Um, I was raised by a single teenage Buddhist mother in drug-infested, gang-infested South Central Los Angeles, California. Never heard the gospel to my first year at university. So, you know, I started reading the Bible, and I really, I thought the God on the left side of the book was a different dude than the God on the right side of the book. I just, it just, it was just, I couldn't, sometimes couldn't even reconcile those things. But I've come to understand and appreciate the fact that there is one redemptive story with one redemptive thread throughout. And it changes the way you look at the Old Testament. I'm grateful to God for that. So I want you to see here in Genesis 45 that just as Jesus said, Jesus said, Moses wrote of me. Moses wrote Genesis. That means Genesis is about Jesus. I don't write the mail, I just deliver it. If Jesus says that it's about him, then it's about him. But not in some sort of allegorical way, you know, where we find the symbol of Jesus in everything that we read. But in very significant ways, we find the message of the gospel and redemption, even here in Genesis 45. Second thing I want us to see here in Genesis 45, I believe outside of the cross, this is the most beautiful picture of forgiveness, the most complete and pronounced picture of forgiveness that we find in all of Scripture. It, you, you, you think about all of the areas or aspects of the Bible, all of the stories that we find in the Bible. You, you're hard-pressed to find a more profound expression of forgiveness than here in Genesis 45. And then thirdly, the reason I think that this passage in particular is very important is because that issue of forgiveness cuts across every aspect of who we are and how we live as believers. Every day, this impacts your life. Every day. Perhaps more than any other characteristic grace or experience that you have as a believer. But more significant because of how frequently you interact with this and because of how it impacts the way we view God, the way we view ourselves, the way we view and interact with others. So with all of that in mind, let's look here at Genesis chapter 45. And as we look at Genesis 45, let me bring you up to speed. Joseph has been sold into slavery by his brothers. Uh, by the way, th that was a blessing because they were going to kill him. Amen? And they were really going to kill him. I mean, oftentimes we look at that and we just sort of read over it. You know, they had this anger toward him and they were going to kill him. And we forget that just a few chapters earlier, they slaughtered the Shechemites. They slaughtered him with a sword. They, I mean, they, they wiped out a village. These are mass murderers. It's one thing when your brother gets mad at you and says, I could just kill you. It's another thing when he's a mass murderer. These guys are mass murderers. They were literally going to murder him. But they did not. Instead, they sold him into slavery. You know it's messed up when being sold into slavery. It's like that, that's, you got the good end of the bargain, you know? <laughs> he ends up in Potiphar's house. And in this story that oftentimes we reduce to this sort of childish understanding of, you know, if you, if you do good and if you're faithful, then God will reward you. Really. He was faithful to his father. His brothers sold him into slavery. He's faithful to Potiphar. Potiphar's wife lies on him. He gets to go to prison for several years. He's faithful in prison. He interprets dreams. Eventually, we know that these dreams are going to get him out of prison. But it's two more years before the cupbearer actually remembered, oh yeah, there was this guy two years ago in prison who interpreted dreams and he can help you, Pharaoh. Now he ends up in Pharaoh's court. 
Now, because of our familiarity with stories and because we love movies, we understand character arcs, you know, we understand how, how a story goes. We look at Genesis 41 and we think, hey, here it is. This is the big payoff. Nothing can be further from the truth. If you read carefully in Genesis 41, when Joseph rises before Pharaoh, if you read very carefully, what you find is every aspect that Moses reveals in the relationship between Joseph and Pharaoh in Genesis 41 is really a perversion of what is supposed to exist between Joseph and Jacob. And it's not good. It's really not good. He's over Pharaoh's house. He's supposed to be over Joseph's house. He's in the land of Egypt. He's supposed to be in the land of promise. Egypt becomes synonymous with the idea of the enslavement of God's people in sin, a place from which we need to be delivered. That's where he is. That's not the payoff. He was clothed in a robe that his father gave him. Now he's clothed in a robe that Pharaoh gives him. He tells his brothers about his dream that they're going to bow down. His brothers want to kill him for it. And now Pharaoh says to the Egyptians, bow down, and they do it gladly. Earlier on, we saw Abraham tell his servant, put your hand under my thigh and swear, swear that you'll find my boy a wife, but not among the pagans. What does Pharaoh give Joseph? A pagan wife. He gives him a pagan name. Names are significant. Why is it that when Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah have their names changed, we want to cry? But Joseph has his name changed, and we think, that's great, he's serving Pharaoh. That's wonderful. This is not the moral of the story. Genesis 41 does not exist, so we can tell our children, listen, hang in there, serve God, trust God, and one day you will serve a pagan who thinks he's God. You'll be away from the covenant community, far away from the people of God. You'll have a pagan identity, a pagan wife, and a pagan name, and a pagan land, and you can say, thank you, Lord. Really? Don't think so. So if chapter 41 is not the payoff, then where do we get the payoff? I think it's in chapter 45. Read with me, if you will. Beginning at verse 1. Joseph has tested his brothers, sent them away. They came back with Benjamin. He tests them again. He's going to keep Benjamin. Judah offers himself as a substitute to pay the price so that Benjamin can go to the father who loves him. Beautiful picture of the redemption and atonement that we have in Christ who offers himself so that his father can lavish his love on the brothers whom he loves. And Joseph can't take it anymore. Then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. He cried, make everyone go out from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it. And the household of Pharaoh heard it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him for they were dismayed at his presence. There's so much here. He, he's overwhelmed. He identifies himself to his brothers. They don't know who he is. They know he's this powerful Egyptian. That's all they know. They know that they've been accused of stealing. They know that this man has the authority to take their lives, but he's not going to. He's just going to keep one of them in prison forever. And now he says, guys, it's me. Far from being relieved, now they're more terrified. Because if he's just this Egyptian guy, all he has against them is they took some grain and they took a few trinkets. If he's Joseph, he's got a lot more. And they literally can't speak. And then the other shoe drops. So Joseph said to his brothers, come near me, please. And they came near. And he said, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. Joseph is giving us a glimpse of his theology now. Next verse. For the famine has been in the land these two years. 
And there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has, he has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry, go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen and you shall be near me, you, your flocks, your herds, all you have. There I will provide for you. For there are yet five years of famine to come so that you and your household and all that you have do not come to poverty. And now your eyes see and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father of all my honor in Egypt and of all that you have seen. Hurry, bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept and Benjamin wept upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. After that, his brothers talked with him. You know, we use the word far too much. But this is awesome. Almost incomprehensible. After what they'd done to him. They, they had done the unthinkable, the unspeakable to him. And he extends forgiveness. I said it before and I say it again. I believe outside of the cross, the most beautiful picture of forgiveness that we have in the entire Bible. Let me do a few things so that we can understand what it is we're dealing with. First, I want to define forgiveness for you. Because many of us wrestle with the issue of forgiveness because we don't know what it means. And it has tremendous implications for our spiritual lives and for our relationships. Listen to this from John Calvin. First, what is forgiveness but a gift of mere liberality? A creditor is not said to forgive when he declares by granting a discharge that the money has been paid to him. But when without any payment, through voluntary kindness, he expunges the debt. Forgiveness is expunging the debt. He, he uses these terms because you almost have to use these commercial terms in order to understand what forgiveness means. Forgiveness is the cancellation of a debt. Forgiveness means you don't have to pay. Now, you know, I, I have up here my, my, my trusty iPad. Say somebody came up here and knocked down my iPad and broke my iPad. And I looked at the person after they you know, broke my iPad, and I said, hey, I forgive you. I, I really do. I forgive you. $800. I'll go get me another one. We're good. I have not forgiven. I have not forgiven. Why? Because I'm making you pay. I did not cancel the debt. I'm making you pay. I didn't forgive. My words are hollow. My words are empty. See, usually when we say, I forgive you, what we're really saying is, I'm not going to blow up at you. Literally, that's all we mean. I'm not going to blow up at you. I'm not going to punch you. I want to, but I'm not going to right now. However, I am going to punish you in significant ways. Now, see, what happens when we get out of this transactional model, when we're not talking about finances anymore? What does it look like for me to make somebody pay, for me to not forgive? Well couple of things. How about depriving another person of my time and attention? I forgive you. I just don't want to be around you. I forgive you. I'm just not speaking to you. The husband and wife situation. I forgive you. I'm just withholding affection. Can't say amen. You ought to say ouch. <laughs> That's not forgiveness. That is the opposite of forgiveness. You are being punitive. You're making the person pay 
that means you're not forgiving. Or depriving a parent of the honor and respect that they're due. I forgive you. But I'm not going to honor you and respect you. You've lost that. Again, you're not forgiving. Depriving a child of their inheritance. We see that with Jacob and Reuben, do we not? And there are people who do that. They don't forgive their kids. They say they forgive them, but then they punish them later on. I got something you want, something you need, something you expect. You're not going to get it. It's punishment. Refusing to acknowledge the accomplishments or achievements or special occasions in other people's lives. My, my, my mother was mean to me. My mother wasn't a good mother. So guess what I'll do? I'll show her I won't send her a card on her birthday. You haven't forgiven. My parents weren't good parents. I'm not going to throw them an anniversary party. I'm not going to show up to celebrate a retirement of somebody that I don't respect, somebody who did that to me. This is making them pay. I'm going to make you pay. I'm not going to send them pictures of their grandkids. I'm making you pay. I'm not going to come see you. I'm making you pay. I'm not going to call you. I'm making you pay. This is unforgiveness. All the while we're saying, oh, I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgive you, but here's how you're going to pay. You're talking out of two sides of your mouth. That is the essence of unforgiveness. How about rejecting gifts? Hey, you got a card. It's from your mother. Throw it away. Hey, you got a gift. It's from your sister. <laughs> You're probably just feeling guilty. I don't want that. You follow me? This is, the, this is what unforgiveness looks like in your everyday life. Rejoicing in the suffering of someone else. You did me wrong. Now you got cancer. That's what you get. That's unforgiveness. And it's completely and utterly hypocritical. See, when you're not forgiving, there are a number of things that are going on. Number one, what's going on is you're being disobedient because you're commanded to forgive. Ephesians 4.32, we'll talk about that more in a moment. But you're commanded to forgive. So first and foremost, you're being disobedient. So refusing to forgive someone is sin. You're sinning against God, which is quite, quite ironic because you're sinning because someone sinned against you and you feel like your sin is justified because it came second. You're like a child saying, he hit me first. Here's a second problem with that. When you're not forgiving a believer, here's what you're saying to God. And don't tell me you're not saying this to God because this is what you're saying to God. It sounds exactly like this. Listen, God, I know that Jesus died on the cross for what that person did to me, and that may be enough to satisfy you, but I require more. The death of Jesus Christ is not enough. I spit on the cross. It cannot pay for this. Die again, Jesus, because what you did wasn't good enough to cover this. They need your death on the cross plus the silent treatment from me. Wow, I better start forgiving believers. I just hold on to my unforgiveness against unbelievers. Now, really? Unbelievers will pay eternally for their sin in hell. The wrath of God poured out against them. So when you don't forgive an unbeliever, what you're saying is, God, your wrath is not enough. This person doesn't just need an eternity in hell. They need an eternity in hell plus me not taking their phone calls. That'll do it. Now, now the scales will be balanced because I got my pound of flesh. This is the wrong answer. But this is what we say to our God. 
the other aspect of this that's just absolutely horrible is that the one who's really paying is you. It has been said, holding on to unforgiveness against another person is like you drinking poison hoping they die. And you allow the bitterness to stir and fester. It's not what Joseph did. Secondly, I want you to understand where, redemptive, where, where forgiveness comes from. Forgiveness is linked inexorably to redemption. Here, Joseph offers this forgiveness, but notice what he says. God sent me here for a purpose, and the purpose was redemption. The purpose was preserving life. By the way, there was a greater redemptive purpose, not just preserving any life, but particularly and specifically to preserve Judah's life. How do we know this? Well, because the whole story of Genesis is about the preservation of the promised seed. Man falls in Genesis chapter 3. The first announcement of the gospel is in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. God says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between her seed and your seed. You will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. That's the announcement that there is one who is coming, seed of the woman who will crush the head of the snake. Very next chapter, what do we see? The first murder. Seed of the serpent, Cain kills seed of the woman, Abel. At the end of that chapter, there's the announcement of another seed, Seth. Chapter 5, we have 10 generations from Adam to Noah through the godly line of Seth. The seed is being preserved. The earth is wiped out. Noah, Shem, Ham, Japheth, and their wives escape on the ark. The seed is preserved. Shem is identified as the promised seed. Eventually, Terah is identified as the promised seed. Eventually, Abraham is identified as the promised seed. There's a promise made to him that he's going to have a child, a son. He goes into Hagar and has Ishmael, not the right one. The promised seed is not Ishmael. The promised seed is Isaac. Isaac has twins. Who's the promised seed? Is it the firstborn Esau? No, it's the secondborn Jacob. Now Jacob goes in and gets married to two different women. Twelve sons. Who's the promised seed? Is it the one he loves the most, Joseph? No. It's the son of the wife that he never even wanted to marry. Judah is the promised seed. And Joseph was hated, enslaved, and imprisoned, and estranged for over two decades so that Judah would live and he would have a son named David someday who would have a son named Jesus someday who would redeem God's people. It is because Joseph looked at his circumstances this way that he was able to forgive. This is Ephesians 4.32. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other. Next line as God in Christ also forgave you. It's rooted in redemption. The ability to forgive is rooted in redemption. We understand Romans 12, 9 or 12, 19. We do not avenge ourselves. We leave it to the wrath of God. Vengeance is mine, said the Lord. I will repay. God is the one who takes care of that. I don't take care of that. I am redeemed and therefore I have the ability to forgive because I understand that your sin is ultimately against God and he's the one that you have to deal with, not me. Who do I think I am? That I need to be avenged. And how hypocritical is it that I look at my own sin so lightly and look at yours so large? See, because it's connected to redemption, this is where we have problems. Because the core of our forgiveness and redemption in Christ is tied up in forgiveness, if I'm walking around with this bad understanding about forgiveness, it leads to a couple of things. First of all, there, there's the radical hypocrites. And the radical hypocrite is the one who, you know, you stub their toe and you're dead to them. They run you over. And they're going, why are you making such a big deal about it? I mean, your, your sin is huge. The sin that happens outside of them is always monumental. And the things that they do are always minuscule. That, that's the first issue, first problem. you got a whole other set of problems we're not dealing with in this sermon. But we'll get to you. <laughs> then there's the other individual. This individual can't forgive. 
won't forgive, always holds on to things, always feels like there needs to be more punishment so that the scales can be set right. So what do they think God is thinking every time they sin? The scales have to be set right again. And they never feel secure in their relationship with God because of their own inability to forgive. And they project it onto their Heavenly Father. And they're always doubting that they're really saved. You see, these are the individuals who believe that if you're really sorry, you won't do it anymore. By the way, think about that for a moment. If you're really sorry, you won't do it anymore. Now we believe in sanctification by sorry. Do you follow? What makes a person sanctified? What makes a person stop sinning? Being really sorry. Because if you're really sorry, being really sorry makes you stop doing it. We didn't need the whole blood of Jesus thing. We just needed God to send down some sorry. Do you see how little sense that makes? But isn't it how we relate to one another? If you were really sorry, you wouldn't do it anymore. That's a lie. That's a lie. Because being sorry is not what stops us from sinning. That's why Jesus says to forgive your brother, not just seven times, but 70 times seven. And it wasn't a math problem. Amen? It wasn't a math problem. Here's some myths that hang us up. And Genesis 45 obliterates these. Myth number one, you can only forgive someone if they ask for forgiveness. There's myth number one. You can only forgive someone if they ask for forgiveness. And there are some of you in this room today, and your life is being controlled by someone who's, they're not even alive anymore. They've been dead for a long time. And you still won't forgive them. And they can't ask, which means you don't ever get to forgive. So you just keep drinking poison, hoping that the person dies again. I would forgive them, but they didn't ask. Um, Joseph's brothers didn't even know he was Joseph, and he forgave them. They didn't ask for anything. And he chose not to punish them. See, we get mixed up because we, you know, read things like, you know, Luke 17, 17, 3. If your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. You know, he sins against you seven times, forgive him seven times. It's great. If he repents, then I'll forgive. If he doesn't, then I won't. First of all, I believe that that is an abbreviation of Matthew 18 and the process of discipline within the church. Secondly, it's inconsistent with what we find in Genesis 45, and it's inconsistent with what we see on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they've asked. Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. That obliterates the myth of you only forgive them when they ask. By the way, if you carry this myth out to its logical conclusion, Forgiveness can only be extended when it's asked for. This is where people get all hung up on, you know, well, what if, what if I die with a sin that's unconfessed? That's almost humorous because it assumes that you're capable of confessing all your sins, which assumes that you're capable of knowing all your sins. As you grow in Christ, Here's one of the things that happens as I I grow in Christ. I learn about sinfulness in myself that before I didn't even know was sinful. Anybody? Anybody? Okay. Stuff I used to just look over. And now I know that it's sinful. Guess what? If I keep getting up with the sun every morning, I'm going to learn more stuff about myself that's sinful that I don't even know is sinful. No one dies with all their sins confessed. No one. No one, no one, no one. 
And the people who think they die with all their sins confessed actually meet God and he goes, you know what? Here's the deal. You actually thought all your sins were confessed, which means that you're incredibly prideful, which was a sin that you didn't confess. <laughs> Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath the flood lose all their guilty stains. He cleanses us from our sin. People don't have to ask you for you to forgive them. By the way, it, you follow that through. If forgiveness means that I give up my right to punish you, and I also believe that you only forgive when somebody asks you to, that means I have to believe that I'm obligated to punish you until you ask me not to. How's that working for you? Another myth that forgiveness requires forgetting. You know what I love? Because that myth is obliterated in this text too. Joseph says, hey, I'm Joseph. The first time he goes, I'm Joseph. How's my daddy? Which again, that was, I mean, he's almost wrong to do that. You know, I'm Joseph. Because there just wasn't, it, I mean, it wasn't the moment. He was not going to get an answer to that question. And the next time he goes, I'm Joseph. You remember your brother? Whom you sold? He hasn't forgotten, and yet he forgave. Forgiveness does not require forgetting. You, you want to know why? Human beings weren't created to forget. When human beings start forgetting things, something's wrong with them. When you can't remember things, you need to go see somebody. Amen? We weren't created like that. The beauty of forgiveness on our end, and again, God, God is the one who can cast our sins into the sea of forgetfulness. God is the one who can blot those things out and recall them no more. He's God, you're not. You remember things. But the beauty of forgiveness is right here. I remember what you did and I forgive you. I remember what you did and I'm gonna bring you to the choicest land. I remember what you did and I want you near me. I love that part of the text. You and your children and your children's children will be near me. Not my daddy and Benjamin. They can be near me. I'll feed y'all somewhere out there. That's not forgiveness. He says, I'm here to preserve life for you. And I want you near me. Is that not what we have in Christ? We sin. We despise him. We reject him. He dies on the cross for our sin. And then I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you may be also. There is a good land and you'll be with me there. That's what we have. Another myth that forgiveness and restoration are linked together inexorably. There's a difference between forgiveness and restoration or forgiveness and reconciliation. I can forgive you and you don't even have to know about it. We can't reconcile unless it's a two-way street. This is important. And this is where a lot of people get hung up. There's a difference between the two. I, I can forgive you when we don't have to reconcile. You can still be a wretch and I forgive you. That means I'm not going to punish you. In order to reconcile, we're going to have to work together. A great example is the marriage that has experienced infidelity. 
there can be forgiveness. I'm not going to punish you. Boy, we're going to have to work a while toward reconciliation. The parent who was abusive can forgive, but we're going to have to work toward this reconciliation. The most common questions I get from people when I talk about forgiveness is this question, this issue of reconciliation. The woman who's been molested, who almost feels guilty when she hears about forgiveness. Every time she hears about forgiveness, she feels guilty. Why? Because she forgives, you know, in order to forgive, you got to forget. And that forgiveness has got to be the same as reconciliation. Therefore, my father, my uncle, my brother molested me. But me being careful around them with my young daughter is not being forgiving toward them. Uh, wrong. There's a difference between forgiveness and reconciliation. Unforgiveness is, you're not even getting pictures. I'm going to punish you by withholding the relationship because of what you did to me. That's unforgiveness. You can forgive and show honor and respect and maybe even have a relationship. But that doesn't mean that you're not careful. Another myth. That forgiveness makes everything better. It doesn't. That's why there's an emphasis on the 70 times 7. If forgiveness made everything better, you wouldn't find that in the New Testament again and again and again. Why doesn't forgiveness make everything better? Because we're sinners. And when we get together, we compound our sin. And we always sin against each other, which means we're constantly forgiving, which is why I said earlier, this is where the rubber meets the road. I mean, this is really the aspect of your Christian faith with which you wrestle more than any other aspect of your Christian faith. Because when we live in relationship with one another, we are constantly forgiving. We have to be. If we're not constantly forgiving, then we're constantly being embittered, one or the other. And there's some of you here right now under the sound of my voice. Your marriage is not characterized by forgiveness, which means it's characterized by bitterness and unforgiveness. Your relationship with your siblings, not characterized by forgiveness, which means it's characterized by growing resentment and bitterness. Your relationship with your parents, not characterized by forgiveness, which means it's characterized by unforgiveness and bitterness. Your relationship with people in the church, it's either characterized by ongoing piled up forgiveness or by ongoing piled up bitterness. It's one or the other. One of those is a picture of the redemption that you have in Christ. And it is glorious as it is displayed. The other of those makes a mockery of what Jesus did on the cross. My daughter is born. I'm a, I'm a father. I'm standing there in the delivery room. Bam, there she is. And I'm overwhelmed by a number of things all at the same time. Number one, just y'all, please clean her up. <laughs> um, number two, give her to me. Just right now, just give her to me. And I hold my baby girl and I weep. And, and I'm, I'm weeping at that moment <laughs> because all of a sudden, for the first time in my life, I feel abandoned. The weirdest thing. My father left me, my mother, when I was a baby. I, I knew my father. I saw my father from time to time. 
but I was raised by my mother. And it was hard. It was hard for her to raise me. But I never felt abandoned by my father. Probably because last two generations, my wife and I, both sides of our family, 25 marriages, 22 divorces. I never saw anything else. And the projects where I grew up, I can tell you the names of a dozen boys that I played with there in the neighborhood. Not one who had a father living in his home. I didn't know what it looked like for somebody to have a father living in their home. It was foreign to me. So I didn't even have a category for abandonment. It was just normal. But my daughter's born and I'm holding her in my hands and I had this overwhelming sense all of a sudden there is nothing on God's green earth that could ever make me leave her. So why did he? It just right then in that moment it was never more real. And I felt abandoned by my father. How could he do that? I mean, if he ever felt what I feel right now, how could he do that? How could he not be in my life? And then my father was converted. And he started calling me all the time. And my wife says to me one day, that was Pop, wasn't it? I said, yeah, how did you know? She said, because you don't talk to anybody else on the phone like you talk to him. And then she said something to me. It just hadn't dawned on me. She said, it's awesome that you're getting to disciple your father. A couple of years later, I got the phone call that my daddy was dead. And all I can remember is the gratitude that I had that God gave me, the time that he gave me on the phone with my dad. And how grateful I was that he had spared me from what a lot of people experience in that moment. I had the opportunity, but I wanted to make him pay. I wanted to make him feel what he made me feel. So I didn't take his calls. I didn't go see him. I didn't acknowledge birthdays. I didn't send him pictures of the kids. I I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. Now he's gone and I can't. I was grateful that God had spared me from that. And it was just his grace, pure and simple. Just his grace. There are some of you, and you're on the other side of that. And your thought is that the opportunity to forgive is gone. But I assure you that it's not. Because right now, right here, today, you can do that. Right here, right now, today, you can look at the cross of Christ and what he has done to forgive you and turn that outward in your relationship with other people. Even people who are long gone. You can do that today. Wife, husband, you can do that today. Because of what Christ has done, you can do that today. Son, daughter, you can do that today. Because of the forgiveness that you've received, you can do that today. Brother, sister, you can do that today. Christ has made that a reality for you, not just a possibility for you. It's a reality for you. It's the only reality that makes any sense. Holding on to unforgiveness, holding on to bitterness, that makes no sense for those of us who are redeemed. 
What? You can't do that. That's not who we are. It's completely incongruent. But what Christ has made real for you is the opportunity to say that because of what he has done, forgiveness is possible for me. And my prayer for you is that that's what you would do today. You wouldn't just come to church today and then go home. You wouldn't just take the box today and be done with it. But that today you would embrace the reality of this glorious gospel. And not just what it has done in saving you from the wrath of God, but also what it has done from saving you from the poisonous venom of unforgiveness. Let's pray.